Hello! Welcome to 3DX, where we're going to show you how to make this stylized potion bottle. So this is our basic silhouette pass. I'm just going for my basic shapes uh, and trying to just get an idea of like what this thing looks like in scale and uh, just what it kind of looks like in silhouette. Think of it like an initial sketch or just the overall shape of the asset. Some of these parts could get reused for the high poly or maybe reused for the low poly, um, but for the most part we're just going for getting comfortable with what we're making. So then once like the basic silhouette is done, um, I jump right into my high poly phase. I use smooth preview with creasing, so the smooth mesh preview button in Maya is the number three, uh, and that smooth preview I eventually export to be my high poly mesh, and instead of using bevels, I use creasing. So when we export this into ZBrush later, it doesn't export creasing, it exports the subdivision level that we're previewing at. So if I wanted to export this as sub G three or four, um, the shortcuts to add or subtract subdivisions on a smooth preview mesh, you can use page up and page down on the keyboard. Um, a turn, alternatively, you can find the setting in your uh, attributes editor for uh, the object that you're looking at. So I like the creasing workflow a little better than beveling because for me it's just easier to change things more quickly and on the fly. So if I think like a bevel is too tight or too loose, uh, I can switch that with the number that's sitting in here in the crease editor. And you can have as many uh, creasing sets as you like for with as many different names as you want. Um, generally speaking, sometimes I'll just pick based on per asset or uh, I might just stick with one creasing set for the whole thing. It really just depends on what I'm working on. So for this part, I think I redid these fins a couple times just until I found a shape that I was happy with. Just going for matching the concept versus what I think kind of looks good uh, in 3D space. Also another thing to note about like the creasing workflow method, it's not a perfect method. Uh, Maya does sometimes tend to forget uh, what creases, are, what edges are assigned to what crease set, especially if you're adding any further edge loops. Uh, I've not really found a solution to that. The only solution that I've found remotely helpful was like UVing the high poly mesh and then like just making sure those cuts for the high poly are the same as the creasing edges that I need. And I can just reselect UV edge borders and then assign those back again. For like a more detailed version on like how I do the creasing workflow, definitely check out the longer version of this video on 3DX's Patreon channel. And that you'll see me do this the entire time. Um, it might be able to help you to better understand how uh, creasing with smooth preview works uh, in comparison with like ZBrush and how you can do that. I went with this method because for me it's the equivalent for 3ds Max Turbo Smooth where they can just turn it on and off. Figured out this method was a great way to just bring that into ZBrush and I can just work on the subdivision level that I export. Uh, and I don't really have to do much setup in ZBrush from there. Like I don't have to worry about creases being imported. And I don't really have to like play too much with trying to set the mesh up. So the only things that I really need to do for setup in here is like make sure back face mask is turned on and that like if I want any sort of symmetry that I can make sure the pivot is at the right spot, etc, etc. So in here, 
Uh, I mostly just use morph targets. Basically, I'll get to the subdivision level that I want in ZBrush, store a morph target, start sculpting away, and if there's something that I don't like, I'll go into the morph target brush in ZBrush and basically just erase it. Um, that's a fantastic little tool, uh, especially if you're just trying to quickly sculpt something. I don't even use uh, layers on this. Uh, I found that just using the morph target was enough for me to get by for the sculpt on here. Um, usually if you're using layers, it's really good if you are actually layering on details. But I'm not doing anything uh, more finite than like these medium to larger cuts and dents and scratches. I also find that when you do teeny tiny details in ZBrush, um, if you forget to store the layer or somebody, maybe your art director doesn't like that detail, it's a lot easier to remove it in paint, like Substance Painter, than it is to remove it in ZBrush because then you also have to rebake. Just something to think about in your workflow. And just for the most part, when I'm in here I'm using like the orb brushes and like the trim brush, just trying to give each dent, crack, and uh, scratch like its own sort of character and detail while also just trying to match the concept. So, like, if I use a stamp, I'm trying to make sure that each stamp doesn't look the same to each other just to avoid, like, sameness. So I put a stamp, moved it around a little, kind of like gave it a little more character with the orb crack brush, and then just kind of went around from there. And this was fun. I really enjoyed just beating up something. <laughs> um, I, th I was taking this part as, like, ceramic, wasn't really sure, but that's what I ended up going with. And the nice thing also about morph targets is not only are they easy to erase, but like the sliders that you see in the bottom right-ish corner, you can morph in between what you had and have. So that's also a super powerful feature. If you tend to exaggerate too much or too little, you can, you know, morph it to more sculpt of what you did or less sculpt of what you did, for example. And especially if you're doing stuff for clients or for your studio, you know, being able to bounce back and forth quickly between iterations is extremely valuable. It's also probably the reason why I try to stick to Maya for most of my high poly stuff too, is because that's a lot easier to change way faster. I mean, not to say you can't do it in ZBrush, I'm just faster in Maya, but um, to be able to change just a bevel in Maya using the creasing workflow um, and then do like some of this like cracking detail in ZBrush, uh, I just like doing it this way. Sticking to the hard surface stuff in Maya and then any like necessary organic details in ZBrush. Which sometimes you can also get away with in Painter, like you don't necessarily always have to do it in ZBrush either. You just have to kind of make that judgment call and figure out what you think is best for your asset. <laughs> Wouldn't it be awesome if your UVs just looked dumb every time you opened it again? Yes. <laughs> but in all seriousness, no. I tend to straighten out my UVs a lot, and I tend to try to keep like things together. So uh, I kept all the orbs separate because I wanted them to have their own character. And I like straightening UVs for um, LODs and for paint skewing and Marmoset. Marmoset has become like a really cool baking tool that if you haven't experienced it yet, I encourage you to try it. Um, I like it because you can basically edit the cage for your normal map skewing if so let's say if you had like a floating detail like a screw or something you can project that not only straight on with the skew detail but you can also set your offset for your cage for your bake uh, versus I find in painter it's really kind of hit or miss and you can't really see what you're doing 
versus in Marmoset, you can totally see like where the projection of the cage is in comparison to uh, the low poly mesh and the high poly mesh at the same time. So I know this is really fast. Uh, I skipped a lot of the low poly so I could get 15 hours of work into 15 minutes of video. So if you want to see the extended versions, definitely go check out that Patreon page. Um, so here in this step, we're doing our texturing now. So uh, I just did some like the basic colors, which is usually just kind of like how I start. And I also this time didn't use the 3DX material. Uh, I encourage you to use it if you would like to use it. Uh, I did it this longhand way because I wanted to show you kind of how I break down texturing and I kind of break it down into about six or seven passes. Um, my first one being just base color. Uh, I just like sticking to color because I'm a painter. That's what I started with <laughs> growing up. So color is the most gratifying to me. And then from there, you can do another pass, which is your you know, materials. So basically, is it metal? Is it plastic? Like how much, you know, gloss or specular does it have? And you can do that for each thing. And then after that, you can do like some of the weathering stuff, grime, dirt. Uh, and I make folders for each of these. If you can see uh, in the layers panel, you can see even empty folders that are set to pass through. And then I do another pass, um, sometime with edging details. I want some certain edges to pop out more than others. You can even grab your uh, green channel from your normal map if you want, import that um, and use that as a mask for edges. Um, and then sometimes I'll even do a gradients pass. So if this is just a static asset and it's not really gonna move, um, you just do a vertical gradient in here, which is what I think I eventually end up doing. And I think I separate the top as well. And then of course the final pass, which you could argue you need or don't need. Uh, it really just depends on your engine. Um, you can do an AO pass and which is from your bake. Uh, and then you can also do a contact AO pass, which I tend to actually bake a second AO map in substance using the low poly mesh, um, which can be valuable, say if have a piece of geometry from your mesh that's like maybe off to the side and you want that shadowing to appear on your low poly mesh but it wasn't attached necessarily in your high poly bake so that can make things pop also and then just once you've got that all set up uh, I would say it's just going back in and refining you know making sure your colors match the concept making sure your materials are excuse me projected correctly and like you're seeing a difference between you know say glass and ceramic in this case and wood um oh speaking of wood that tag uh, i remodeled it i think three times um i couldn't figure out for the life of me how i wanted that to look in the sculpt and high poly phase and it wasn't until oh i think like two months until I figured out how I wanted to do it. So <laughs> I was happy that I didn't give up on this piece. Uh, but just to know that like that kind of like getting stuck part is totally normal. Don't beat yourself up. Um, in fact, even if like you can't get the help that you need right away, um, not to say that there isn't help out there, but if for some reason you are very stuck, don't get discouraged. Um, it's all good. It happens all the time. You just have to be patient with yourself and persevere. Uh, so I hope you learned something from this video. Uh, if you're interested in me, check out ejtheartist.com and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye.